Welcome to the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. If your job involves working with or influencing people's behavior, this podcast offers invaluable insights into what makes people tick. Through personal interviews that are thoughtful and surprising, we explore the full range of the roots to people smarts that can help you make or break your own career. My name is Marie Gervais, and with a PhD in culture and learning in the workplace and my own cultural journey, I bring the mysteries of human beings at work around the world to you. Through conversations with very diverse people, examining the groups they were born into and the ones they chose to belong to, my podcast takes a deep dive into why people do what they do and how they belong. Hone your skills to manage others and to be a better human being at work with the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. And now for today's episode. Hello, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. I'm very excited to present to you today Nick Johnson, who holds a Bachelor of Communications degree in Marketing and Advertising and a Master's in Public Relations from Bonn University, Australia, where he graduated top of his class. He is a number one international best-selling author and is dedicated to raising awareness and eliminating the stigma around the phenomenon of executive loneliness, which he has identified as a personal struggle himself, resulting from isolation and depression, and which is much more widespread than we think. As the co-founder and managing director of the Singapore branch of Executives Global Network, Nick is passionate about matching senior executives in confidential peer groups where they can help each other face challenges and identify opportunities. He has worked as an international general manager and in direct sales and marketing across Asia, Australia, and Europe. Nick is enthusiastic about supporting his local community, is a volunteer and fundraiser for the Samaritans of Singapore, and serves with the Suicidal Hotline in Singapore, as well as frequent community service for support groups. I am very excited to have Nick join us today on the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for having me, Marie. I'm excited as well. I was having a few technical difficulties before I joined Nick, so normally we would have had a little bit more time to chat, but I'm still looking very much forward to the interview and uh, happy that he could make time. What time zone are you in right now, Nick? I'm in Singapore, so it's bright and early, 7 a.m. in the morning here, so it's a perfect start to the day. Uh, well, thank you for getting up so early to be here for the podcast listeners. It's fantastic to be up early. You know, I'm an early riser these days trying to go for a walk or some or a jog or something like that. I think the mornings are the most peaceful time of the day. They are. They are for sure. So what I read was your formal uh, bio, but maybe tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you grew up, something about your family. Yeah, sure. I was born in Sweden uh, and playing, you know, watching Sweden play Canada in ice hockey as I grew up. Uh, had a good childhood, I would say, but it was something in me that always wanted more. And I then moved to Australia when I was about 21 years of age and I studied over there and then after that I realized that Australia was quite far away from Sweden so I moved to Asia which is halfway and that's where I am since 2004. So I lived mainly in Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam and now for the last five years in Singapore and I'm also now working extensively in Malaysia. So my career then was in general management mainly managing hospitals, clinics but also a few years years in operations in the fashion industry so I've really seen a lot and when I was in working during my career perhaps as you mentioned I experienced some loneliness and it's only when I left the corporate world and looking back I realized that I wasn't alone there was many more executives that are suffering from loneliness and now I'm running confidential peer groups for senior executives and business owners where they can discuss the work related challenges so what I'm seeing and hearing is, you know, the stories of all these executives running the companies here in Asia. Hmm. Well, that's great. Uh, now people often say that they didn't have any problems in their childhood, but the depression and loneliness and uh, resulting things must have come from somewhere. So what can you share from your childhood that you believe were obstacles you had to overcome and that might have helped you become the person you are today? That's a great question, Marie. And that's something that I asked myself many, many times. And I think uh, uh, many times, though, we can easily come to the conclusion that we're looking for someone to blame and something there. And I've tried to move on from that. But what I do realize is that perhaps 
perhaps uh, like many others in uh, once we are had the uh, industrialization of the world was that my father was always working he was working long hours trying to you know make money for the family both my mother and father grew up poor so naturally they were quite hungry uh, you know to make money to build their own house and so on so i was growing up being at home mainly with my mother so i didn't see my father much and i do believe that then growing up i've been sort of trying to perhaps get his attention or other people's attention by working so hard and i call myself if i'm looking back even at the university as you mentioned that i graduated at the top of my class perhaps an anxious overachiever mm-hmm. that's so common for entrepreneurs isn't it Yes, that's what fuel us forward, right? And But it's why we work so hard to prove to ourselves and prove to others that we can do it. And that underlying anxiety there, uh, you know, when we're playing all the different case scenarios forward uh, and always perhaps also thinking about the worst scenario. And we just work so hard to make sure that we don't go there. Yeah, but then it produces other effects that are not so great. It does, Marie. And, and all it takes is perhaps some life events that goes against you. And that's what happened when I actually fell down in 2015. I was trying to hold things together, but it didn't work. I resigned from a job because I didn't feel well. I went through a divorce and before I knew it, I was sitting there lonely, uh, isolated. And I didn't know what was home. And to make matters worse, I exchanged my morning routine of a jog or a walk with going for a, a beer in the evening with friends. And, you know, good habits changed to bad habits. I changed my diets. And also with that, I gained weight. And before I knew it, it, I, I found myself being depressed and isolated. Mm-hmm. What did you do to overcome that? Well, I had to slowly go worse and worse for three years and hit rock bottom before I was willing to patch my life together. And it was only there I basically managed to find the support, you know, because again, uh, we are trying to do everything we can to hide what is going on behind the scene. And uh, as I say in my book, we, I call it a smiling depression where, you know, the pictures we put up of ourselves on social media and how we want people to see us is perhaps not the truth. And I managed to hold that together for two, three years, but eventually the wheels fell off and I, I fell into actually then and I needed recovery. I had this stage, I had even uh, got an alcohol addiction, which also is very common among high overachievers when we lose what we have and we have held on too much to the possessions and our titles and everything else when we lose that uh, we are looking for something else to replace that hmm. so let me just backtrack a little bit because i forgot to ask you earlier about your adolescence something in your adolescence can be a happy moment doesn't have to be anything sad or traumatic but is there some incident uh, that you can specifically talk to that happened during your adolescence can you that- just clarify this question marie what you're looking for please well I mean, we all had things that we needed to go through, you know, uh, when we were children and, and adolescents. When I was a child, I was always in different schools. So because I had to move to different schools all the time, I was on the outside frequently. And one time, this other classmate of mine took me aside and said, I'm going to show you how to throw a baseball properly so you're not always picked last for the team. And I was eternally grateful to her for that. And that's an incident that stands out in my mind as a positive incident. A negative incident was that my mother had some kind of a thing about holidays and special days that she always had to ruin. It must have come from something that she experienced in her childhood, some intergenerational thing, but I developed a phobia of any kind of special day (laughs) as an adolescent and as a young adult and anxiety around it just because in my past, those days were always significantly ruined by the behavior of my mother. (laughs) So I had to learn to overcome that. And that was not an easy task. So I'm just to give you a couple of things that one was a happy incident and one was a difficult one that I think helped to shape me. So I'm wondering if you have something more specific. People are very easily speak about generalities, but it's the incidents that make the story so much more interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that, Marie. And, And I think one thing that stands out, I remember my father always telling me when I grew up that the easiest way is not always the best way. And always encouraged me to think deeper and not just follow everyone else but you know really question everything and to find perhaps a different path and that's what I did I grew up in this small village in Sweden with 
60,000 people. And of all my friends in high school and so on, I'm the only one who was looking at, you know, moving as far away as you could from Sweden to Australia. And today have an international career. There was no one else who had that. So what he told me then was something that always stuck with me. And I always was looking for, you know, the, the different answers and the d- different path. And even when I was looking at where should I go and study, you know, I looked up which are the best universities in communication. I looked at Australia, I looked at North America, and I looked at the UK, and then eventually I settled at the private university in Australia. So that was certainly something that really resonated with me, you know, then in a positive way, it drove me forward, but eventually also it set me to my failure because now I live very differently after my recovery journey. Mm -hmm. Everything's kind of double-edged, right? There seems to be a positive and a negative to everything when you think about it. Absolutely. And what I learned in my recovery program is basically the opposite. And we even have slogans like easy does it or one day at a time, you know, which is perhaps at the heart of every recovery program is one day at a time, because it is when we overthink it and we think too far ahead. That's when we create too much pressure and stress and that we feel us with perhaps uh, anxiety attacks. Yeah. And also because trauma is created quickly and in order to release it, you need to slow things down. And sometimes when you slow it down, it it can backfire on you. So there's always a double-edged sword. Yes. So what about groups you were born into? I mean, you were born in Sweden. There's a national culture. There was probably a regional culture. There's your family culture. There's the language. There may have been a religious influence. There may have been a socioeconomic influence. It really, I define culture as any groups, two people together, just mm-hmm. for a few minutes, start to develop a culture between the two of them. So the ones you were born into, you didn't have a choice over. What would you say, reflecting back, has influenced you now? Well, as I grew up in Sweden, I really struggled to find myself associating myself with the culture. Again, because my father was working hard and away a lot, I was looking for some other leader and I didn't really find it. And one thing that I I did, though, in the teen years between 18 and 20 and so on, I I rode motorcycle. So I was looking for something to do, which was a hobby. I like to get out in the greenery and so on. Uh, But also then looking for leadership, as you know, like, like the local motorcycle club would have you know a president and so on there would be people there would be organizations so i used to you know go with them we used to travel around and driving motorcycle and looking for you know bike meets and camping and things like that i remember driving around europe over the summer so that was the first time i I found something which was a little bit closer to me at home at least So that would have been a group that you joined when you were able to make that choice yourself. And that would have influenced you and helped you develop a sense of community, right? Yes, it did. But I would say the most positive effect was that I didn't want to be part of it. It was the best I could find at home. But I was always thinking I want something else. I want further away. And this is not what I want. There was just something in me that, again, was anxious that I wanted to achieve more. And it wasn't so much about me wanting to be in a group where we only have fun and drive a motorcycle. I wanted to achieve more things. I don't wanted to do bigger things. So that's why we just kept looking outside of Sweden eventually. Mm -hmm. But you also had influences from growing up that you may not have identified yet. I grew up in Canada. My parents were immigrants. And the way that they saw life and the kinds of struggles that they went through had a lot to do with being in the immigrant community and not having relatives around. And that was definitely formational for me, whereas my husband was from, you know, generations of French Canadians on one side and even longer generations from France on the other side. And he can trace his lineage back so far, I have no clue. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so they were completely different settings. So in my family setting, it was like forge the new and, you know, you're part of the new country and think like a new person. And in my husband's family, it was embrace the tradition. So just to show you, we're not usually aware of what we've experienced until we run up against something that highlights it for us. So when you think of those examples, is there something that you have become aware of that has to do with Sweden and being Swedish? that you believe has an influence on you? 
Yeah, certainly. I think, uh, again, you know, growing up, then I was born in the 70s and 80s when Sweden was doing really well for itself. And it was a working culture. Everyone was working. Uh, the economy was doing well. And as I said, my parents were trying to, you know, achieve getting a house, a car. I remember the first VHS video play. I remember the first microwave. You know, it was an era when we could achieve possessions. And that was was about I was looking at the neighbor's car comparing with our car as a as a 12 year old and you know I remember my parents being proud when they could park a nice car on the driveway so it was all about those things what I didn't have much about was perhaps being introduced to religion and spirituality that was something that was more associated with perhaps holidays <laughs> and we perhaps went to you know church once or twice a year but I was never introduced apart from at school religions and spirituality so that was something that I didn't bring with me I didn't have uh, something a power greater than myself with me uh, when I went out in the world and building my career eventually. And that is something that I think was lacking and missing from my childhood. Hmm. That's an interesting observation. I think a lot of people have similar experiences to that, or they moved away from what they initially experienced as they grew older and started to think things through a little bit. What about now? Do you feel you have some kind of a spiritual or religious affiliation at this point? So when I came into my recovery program, then in 2018, a big part of most recovery programs is uh, about deflating the ego. It's about being ready and open up yourself and understanding that you are not the center of the universe, especially if you're talking here with senior executives and so on. Uh, many have a big ego. It's what fuels them. It's what drives them. It's what make them who they are. But it's also a very difficult place to be. So for any recovery to be able to open, it's about really about that ego. And as I said, to deflate that. So that's also a journey I had to get into. And in most recovery programs, you don't talk about a specific religion. It's about spirituality. It's about just understanding that it's something bigger out there and you're part of that. And with that, then you stop focusing so much on yourself. And it's more about focusing on others and being of service to others. And that's when the big switch happens in most people in recovery. And that was also my experience. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how you go from discovering your true self and letting go of the fake self, which is the inflated ego, and that then that moves you into service. And that service also helps you discover more about your true self, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And you, it's about paying it forward. And that's how many of these recovery groups are built up. And if you're asking what is the secret you know, behind them all, and I just read a big study by Harvard, who did a study on one of the major ones there. And they said, you know, it's, first, it's the power of peers, but it's also that people are finding spirituality again, that they think and they believe that they're part of something else because then you're not always looking for the answers inside yourself. You can accept that some things that perhaps you cannot figure out by yourself and that you can turn that over to then a power greater than yourself. And just to have that with you when you feel helpless, hopeless, that it's okay, then that is, I think, the saver here that you're mm -hmm. not in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think that helps with the loneliness? It certainly does as well. And the isolation and the loneliness is broken because of also the vulnerability. The fact that you suddenly decide to start to speak up, even if it is in a protected environment, like in my case, you know, all these groups are anonymous, confidential. And the last thing is repeated after a meeting when you have been talking is that, you know, what has been said here, stay here. And anonymity is the core pillar of everything. So therefore you feel that it's safe. And in my case, then I started to open up and sharing things that I never shared with another human being. And as you come back, and typically you come back almost every day for these meetings, you open up more and more every time. And it takes perhaps a couple of months until you really been honest in your sharing. But every time you probably expose yourself a little bit more because you, you practice yourself on vulnerability. And eventually, I started to even open up on some of my biggest secrets and challenges outside of the room because I started to feel safe right so that means my close family my partner decided to you know start opening up and so on and I've seen similar journeys and experiences in many people. So how has that development and learning affected the way you see yourself as a leader now? Completely different you can say that I'm an open book I even put my life story in a book uh, along with other 
senior executives and business owners who I interviewed for the book. But uh, anyone who go to Amazon and, and buy my book and read my life story, the, the moment where I hit rock bottom is uh, the opening chapter of the book. So that I'm no longer a secret. I don't have to hide behind uh, a facade. It's all there. And so people who even perhaps want to have a business meeting with me or meet me, uh, if they listen to my story or even someone coming for a job interview, typically they will look at my profile and they would have at least got an understanding of where I am. So therefore, you know, when, when I start any meeting, I'm already exposed, which means that they feel safe to also be open and more honest with me than they would normally. Yeah. And when you're in charge of telling your story, you tell it your way instead of having other people trying to second guess it or psychoanalyze you, which is terrible. So you can tell your own story and that makes you vulnerable, but it also gives you a sense of control at the same time, I would think. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's quite rare uh, that someone does this, especially in Asia where I am. That is why, you know, I'm now a founder and volunteer for the local SOS Samaritans, the suicide prevention agency, because this is what it's all about. It's about speaking up before it's too late. It's about daring to, to say if you're not well, asking for that help, because as we know, uh, a problem shared is a problem, you know, that is already on the way to be solved. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So tell me a little bit about that, because that's certainly about cultural disconnects. I mean, you grew up in Sweden, you went to Australia, now you're in Asia and multiple different Asian contexts. And you saw that there was a need there. What was the need? The need was for people to be able to speak out about their real situation or how would you describe it? Well, let's look at it from two perspectives here. Uh, first, you have all the expatriates and a lot of them from North America, Europe, Australia and so on who live and work uh, for the big multinational firms here in Southeast Asia, typically running, you know, the region for the biggest multinationals here based in Singapore. So they are isolated from many of them don't have the parents with them, for example, uh, and some even are separated from the partners. So they're living and working remotely under huge pressure, traveling around uh, Asia. So they obviously need the support. They need someone to speak to. They feel that they are, you know, working around the clock and feeling isolated many times. Then you have the second group, which is the locals. And Asians are typically more closed than Westerners still are. And it's even more stigmatized to discuss anything related to mental health and challenges. This is something that they want to keep behind closed doors. So I've been addressing both these groups uh, and are on a day to day basis. And what's that like for you? Well, as I said, it's about giving back and it, this is my way of giving back. I was given a gift in 2018 when I was brought to my knees and I found that gift of desperation, which is needed sometimes to find yourself in recovery. And it's the most amazing journey that I ever gone through. What I learned through recovery is something that I want to share. And people don't have to go as deep and as, as low as I did. There are ways that you can actually, you know, connect and speak up earlier about the things that are not so good before they become extremely bad and before it goes too late. So what happened then, Marie, is sadly in 2019, when I was one year into my recovery, a friend and colleague of me uh, uh, died of suicide. And we had no idea that he was suffering. He, he looked on the outside like he was living the life of his dreams. He had just traveled to Mount Everest and climbed up to base camp. He had a girlfriend he had just shared on social media that he never been happier in his life. And suddenly he was gone. And I was just full of questions and we couldn't find any answers and that's when i decided to go public with my story i decided to speak up i made a linkedin post that, a video that went viral and before i knew it within 24 hours i was on live radio interviewed by newspapers and magazines everyone said it's so rare that someone is speaking about this you know everyone want to talk about successes but no one want to talk about these struggles and from there on marie i i just have kept going. I wanted to just keep talking about this before it's too late for some people. Mm, that's a wonderful mission to have in your life. Turning the obstacle into really a transformation, not only for yourself, but for others. 
Yes, it gives it gets me out of bed, and uh, you know I'm today a, a volunteer and fundraiser not only for that organization but also I'm supporting other recovery groups. And no matter where I'm going, if I'm going on a holiday somewhere, let's say I'm going to Phuket in Thailand for a holiday, just when I booked my trip in the hotel, I will look up and see are there any facilities there? Is it a, a rehab in the region? Then I'm normally contacting them and offering to be of service. And normally they invite me for a dinner and I share my story. And, you know, for people then who perhaps uh, are just in recovery uh, and many of them could come from around the world for a treatment like that, for them to see someone who was there four or five years ago and see that there's actually light at the end of the tunnel, that's exactly what they need to hear. And, you know, for me then to come in there and see these people who are still shaking, perhaps just, uh, you know, in a few days into recovery, also act as a reminder to me how grateful I should be for where I am today. That's beautiful. Thank you. I want to backtrack again. I missed a question because I get so interested in what you have to say. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the difference between your temperament and your personality. Temperament being traits you're typically born with and then personality, what you add on later. You can see right away in young children that some seem very friendly and others seem more timid. Some seem to be very systematic in their pursuit of learning how to do the things that kids learn as they're, you know, like learning to walk and learning to hold things. And and others just seem to be on the discovery, however it randomly happens. What would you say has been something you were born with, part your temperament? And then what did you add on later as part of your personality? I never settled for anything. I was not comfortable or happy with what I have as a 13 year old. When I was 13, I was looking at the the boys who were 15, who was already riding small motorcycles. And I didn't have any money. I asked my parents if I could have one. Of course, they would say, no, you need to earn it. Otherwise, you can't get it. That was one thing. And also legally, I couldn't drive until I was 15. But I always wanted to achieve more already at a very young age. And that was the era then, we're talking, you know, late 80s when the personal computer just started. So I started to import and sell computers as a 13 and 14 year old and I made quite a lot of money at the time. Uh, my parents were supportive and looking at me, you know, and as a small young entrepreneur opening up this shop behind the scene in the garage and, you know, phone, selling on the phone, advertising in magazines and newspapers and earning great money. So before I turned 15, I had already enough money to buy everything I wanted, including a stereo equipment, which was important then. And I bought a motorbike. And of course, the police caught me because I was driving before I was 15. So I was always that kind of guy who walked my own way there was nothing my parents could say or do because I would just go my completely my own way and that's why eventually also I moved to Australia a few years later what do they say you marched to the beat of your own drummer yeah you heard your own inner beat much stronger than anything that was outside of you yeah certainly and if we look back to it here perhaps it was because I didn't have that father figure or uh, I didn't around me but all I could see was that they were working hard from a young age so I copied their behavior I also wanted to work hard I wanted to become an adult I wanted to prove myself and I did that by already then starting to work extremely hard but it was not only selling computers it didn't matter what I signed up for if it was selling newspapers or magazines which was even I think I was 12 year old then I would become I'm, you know, the top five top performer in the country and I would get rewards and money. So that I already started to get the taste for that at a young age. And that's something that I wanted to keep going. Refresh my memory. Did you have brothers and sisters? One sister. One sister. Older or younger than you? Younger, three years. Oh, I see. So that's how you were pretty much born. That's your temperament. What's changed? What have you added on? Well, you spoke because... a little bit about that with sort of deflating mm. the ego and slowing down. Yeah, I had to change because once I found myself into recovery, I realized that these traits, these personality traits had to be changed. It was not all about me. It was about others. It was about letting go and, you know, living a day at a time. And uh, other slogans, as I mentioned, is, you know, easy does it. And what I now learned is that it's about progress over perfection. And I live life a lot differently, a lot more in harmony and so on these days, Marie. And I'm also almost five years now with no alcohol. I'm avoiding, you know, any form of drugs or alcohol for that matter. And I'm trying to just live a good life, a healthy life. And it's beautiful. It's much more calm and it's an easier way of living. Mm, That's wonderful. 
you've moved to different countries and you've experienced cultural difference. So is there something that stands out in your mind as being kind of a, a moment when you thought, well, this is really different from what I thought everybody did? Well, I would say every country have their own challenges. And I think the most difficult is when everyone around you speak a different language. And as they do here in Asia, you know, and it's very difficult to try to catch up and learn a new language for every country you move to. So you just realize that somehow you can never become part of the culture, you know, or the country. I guess it's different if you settle down in one country, you spend your whole time there. But for myself and many others who move here, we move around one assignment, bring you to the next country, and then you start all over. And just in a couple of months, say, Marie, I'm again going to move after five and a half years being based in Singapore, moving over to Malaysia. And I just came back from there last night from a business trip. And again, you know, it's new uh, culture, new language, new legislations. You have to get your whole head around it again. And I think this is very challenging. But these days now moving into a country, the first time I'm going to move to a new country after being into recovery, and I'm approaching it in a very different way. I'm not trying to overthink things. I'm not trying to, you know, put my own way forward too much. I'm trying to just take it a step at a time and going slower and not having too much expectations on what's going to happen. I know it's going to be challenging and uh, I'm, I'm welcoming the journey in a completely different way this time. Sounds like you're more present to the moment. Yes, absolutely. I hope at the, this stage of my life that I'm more ready for challenges like this and it would be a, a smoother transaction. So we're reaching the end of the interview and I just wanted to ask if somebody works with you, what do you need to be at your best? What allows you to be your best self in a work environment? It is to be human and to really practice vulnerability. I would say if you are a leader, you cannot expect your team to be vulnerable with you unless you have opened up first and shared some of the issues that you've gone through in life. We all have had them. The only difference is that some keep them deeply secret. And I just want to end by sharing a story here also, Marie, because as I told you, I'm an open book. And of course, if someone coming into a job interview with me, naturally, they will have researched me. And I recently had one gentleman who came to my job interview and we went into a deep conversation right away. And during this job interview, he even admitted to me and he showed his scars that he had had uh, at the young age two suicide attempts by himself. And that's how vulnerable he was in a job interview. I decided to hire him and you can imagine how open and how warm conversations we can have whenever he feels that oh, pressured or it's something that he's not comfortable about he will immediately pick up the phone and call me and we will have a talk about it so that's a key message i want to share don't try to hide behind that facade just be human and because we all have our stories and journeys let's just share them with us that's a lovely story i just have one burning question about that <laughs> In an Asian environment where it's so important for people to preserve face and face saving is such a big deal. Do they react the same way to you being vulnerable and open as somebody who would not be from Asia? No, there's more silence. And uh, and we see that also even in, in the recovery groups I'm part of. It's mainly Westerners, about 90% Westerners. It's e even harder to find the people who need support of the Asians. They are typically hiding. And that's why, why I'm on a mission to really break down the barriers around this. And at least no, knowing that people who come to me, that I'm a safe gateway for them. Hmm. You might need an Asian partner to help you out with that. Yes, that's right. And I'm married to an Indonesian lady who is fully supportive of this as well. Ah, there you go. You've already got one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your soapbox moment. What would you like to promote? And maybe tell us the title of your book too. Yeah, sure, Marie. Uh, my title of the book is called Executive Loneliness. It's available on Amazon. If someone prefers it as an audio book, then it's on Audible. And uh, if anyone want to look me up on LinkedIn, they found me under Nick Johnson. That's N-I-C-K-J-O-N-S-S-O-N. -S -S Perfect. That's great. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Marie, I think uh, I want to thank you for having a great conversation, important conversation this morning. And just my final word would be if someone has something on their mind, uh, write it down and think about who you can talk to about this and take action right away. Oh, that's a great message to leave the listeners with. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, Marie. Nick Johnson took the problems of high-achiever executive loneliness and turned them into strategies for success. 
He teaches groups of executives to support and overcome challenges together and is an example of overcoming addiction through his participation in marathons and Ironman events while volunteering to support problem drinkers and suicide hotlines. Facing his own struggles and finding ways to connect through building group strength have been key in his professional and personal life. Now that he's been through the experience of recovery, Nick is approaching the journey of learning a new language and culture in Singapore, not as an overachiever, but in a slower, more present way, savoring the moments as he goes. I enjoyed my interview with Nick and his honesty and hope this episode will resonate with you. If you would like to share it with a friend, please do, because that's how we increase our listenership. Thank you so much for listening and may culture and leadership connections continue to guide and inspire your day. Want to show some appreciation? You can buy me a coffee. What? How do you buy a coffee for a podcast owner? Well, there's a way. Let me explain. You go to buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. That's spelled M-A-R-I-E-G-E-R-V-A-I-S. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. And when you go to that website, what's going to happen is you'll get a chance to click on one, two, three, four, or five cups of coffee at $5 a piece to help contribute to the cost of the podcast. And yes, it's $5 for a cup of coffee because it's quality coffee for a quality podcast. So I hope you will contribute and you'll help us to reduce the costs of the podcast by going to buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. Thank you in advance for your generous contribution.